I want to share a story with you guys today. It's a little long-winded, but just bear with me. Back in 2018, I wandered the floor of Pack South with a friend, patiently hunting the show floor for games to play and possibly feature on my show in Dealer. My friend told me there was a game that I absolutely had to play at a booth. And I walked up to this booth and uh, there was two French Canadian guys there, just sitting there, uh, Martin Bruard and Terry Bonlegier. Terry lit up when he saw me and said that he watched my videos all the time and asked if I had any interest in playing their game. I figured, why not? I had no idea what I was getting myself into and I figured I would give it a shot for just a few minutes and then get up and move on to the next booth, right? I sat down and I played the demo and minutes turned into hours. Terry came by to check on me and I asked if, hey, was there any more of the game I could try out? And he revealed that the game was essentially done and he let me play more of it. And I sat there at the booth for hours and hours on end and I became obsessed with this game. And this game was called The Messenger. I was absolutely floored. I knew this game was going to be a massive hit, but with no publisher at the time, Terry and Martin trudged on. And I did whatever I could to help. I told everyone I ran into at that PAX, play this game, The Messenger. It's over there at that booth. This is the one. I walked around all weekend long and I told all my content creator friends, all my developer friends, my publisher friends, go check out The Messenger. Asking them to go to that booth and experience the game. Months later, I go to PAX East. I hit the show floor and I could not stop smiling ear to ear. Devolver Digital's booth was dressed head to toe in takeover banners and monitors, displaying everything about the messenger. They had signed with Devolver Digital and I knew they had done it. This game was going to be phenomenal, an instant hit. And I walked up and I gave Terry the biggest hug and I congratulated him and the team. They had to be so proud of the work that they had just accomplished by signing with Devolver. Finally, at PAX West 2018, a few months later, the messenger was once again there at the Devolver booth, but this time, it was different. The game had came out that weekend exactly. It had come out during PAX. Now, I unfortunately couldn't make it that weekend because I was considering stopping YouTube altogether. I had just announced New Game Plus the year prior, I think, if my timeline's correct, and my mental health was very bad. I felt like I didn't deserve to be here doing what I was doing. I was struggling to find myself, to find my passion. Lo and behold, Terry, right before PAX, sent me a code for the messenger. I decided then and there that I was going to do what I thought would be one of the last videos I ever made in my career. So I made this video, and to my surprise, the next thing I know, all weekend long, I'm seeing hundreds and hundreds of photos from fans all over the world who were there at PAX West taking photos of my dumb face on the Devolver booth. Terry was playing my video a few times that weekend throughout the show. I, I couldn't believe it, you know, it's, I never had seen anything like that before. All I've ever wanted to do is make an impact on the gaming industry. And I realized that that's not actually what I wanted to do. I want to make an impact on real people, real genuine people. And I saw that inadvertently I contributed to Terry and his journey for The Messenger. And thinking about it now, my heart is just so full and warm and it makes me appreciate Terry that much more. Terry and I would go on to have a fantastic friendship. Every year at my charity show, IndieLand, Terry would show up and he brings his A game every time. He's eaten hot sauce, he's waxed his arm in pain with me and other celebrities and content creators and developers. Him and his team have donated thousands of dollars every year. We've given away over a thousand codes for the messenger alone over the last five years. And what's insane is that I never asked Terry to do any of this. His heart is just that damn big. And he followed whatever the f me and my team were doing. And I will never forget that. Several years later, Terry would message me and he showed me the Kickstarter trailer for a new game that he was so nervous for. It was called Sea of Stars and I can tell that he was so scared. He didn't think that people would be as excited as he would be for this game. I saw that trailer 
And I told them what I told them earlier this week when Sea of Stars came out. This game is going to change the world and the landscape of indie games forever. When the Kickstarter came out, without hesitation, I backed the game to the highest tier that I could afford with the promise of doing all these crazy things that come with the Kickstarter. And that Kickstarter destroyed every goal with thousands of people ready to enjoy the game. In that time, Terry has personally handcrafted demos for Indieland, and that's just for me. Doing certain tasks that I had to complete would lead to me raising thousands of dollars for charity donated by him and his team. And at the least, it put Indieland on the map. At the last Indieland, Terry put me in the game as a quest for the demo. A demo designed just for me. And I thought that was so cool to see that because I was in a game, temporarily at least, in a way that no one else has the pleasure of being involved. My friends, my family, my fans, all in the room got to enjoy my dumb face as I was on a quest with the Solstice Twins to save myself. And I thought, holy shit, what a fun time. I've done it all. After years of anticipation, Sea of Stars is here. And many of you right now are probably playing the game. You're gonna maybe buy the game. You have it on your wish list. Maybe you're probably watching this video as you're playing it, who knows? But a couple of months prior, I realized something so stupid of me. And I do this very often. I didn't fill out any of my Kickstarter rewards. I felt so stupid because I cared a lot about this project and I, I should have done something earlier. So I messaged Terry in a panic and I told him, hey, I messed up and he told me I had nothing to worry about as long as he had my permission and trusted him. So I said, of course. I got my code for Sea of Stars and I've been playing it for these last several weeks. And after playing the game for several hours, I came across a really special moment. There's a place in Sea of Stars where you come across this town that's looking to help rebuild itself from nothing. And you have to do several side quests for a character who's a builder. A guy who's trying to support this town for the betterment of its citizens. Someone who's trying to make an impact in people's lives. And this character is called Gerard the Constructionist. When you give him various plans for the establishments in town, he strikes a certain pose that's familiar to my intro. And I realized in that moment that Terry took our friendship and integrated it not only into Sea of Stars, but as the completion process for the people out there when they play this game. Hey everyone, my name is Gerard the Constructionist and welcome to another brand new episode of The Completionist where we don't just beat the games, we complete them. Today, I am more than biased. I cannot say enough how fucking gray area this all is. And I'm not here to argue that I'm a games journalist or that I'm better than them, I'm not. I'm not here to argue that I know more about games than anyone else, I don't. I'm here to tell you one simple fact. Sea of Stars through and through is one of the greatest fucking games that I've ever completed and that bias, that bias is so real. But I told you this gigantic, long-winded, unnecessary story because unironically, even with me saying all of this, look at the fucking scores. This is one of the best games to ever have a completion bonus. On this show, we always talk about how games give you nothing for completing it. How many times have I given a game a play it or a finish it because you didn't complete it? This game, Sea of Stars, gives you everything for completing it. So what I'm saying is, complete Sea of Stars. I promise you, you will not regret it, bias and all. So buckle up, it's a wonderful journey. Quite possibly one of the best I have ever been on. And that's even before I tell you a goddamn thing about this game. Let's go. Yes!
Stars is a long in development RPG that has been forged from a shared sense of nostalgia and passion by Sabotage Studios. Releasing in a year stacked with all timer games, you might think this indie title could easily get written off. But within an hour of my journey to complete Sea of Stars, I realized it would be something special, an instant classic. By the time I put the game down, it became not only one of my favorite things I've played this year, but Sea of Stars may have cemented itself as one of my top RPG experiences of all time. Yes, it's that powerful. In my completionist video for The Messenger, I talked about how that game is not a cash-in. It's not an overload on easy nostalgia, and neither is Sea of Stars. You might watch the trailer or play the demo and think to yourself, this game is just another pixel art RPG trying to appeal to that nostalgia. That is not the case here. Early on in the making of documentary made by the team at The Escapist, Terry lays out the mission of Sabotage as a company to draw inspiration from games the team loved as kids and create experiences that are as good as our memories. Sea of Stars manages to do exactly that by blending elements of Chrono Trigger, Super Mario RPG, Secret of Mana, and even more recently with RPGs like Golden Sun, all into a beautiful, constantly rewarding game. I've said before how I grew up on turn-based RPGs and have always loved them. Something about the scale of storytelling combined with intricate systems and memorable characters meant that I could enjoy completing them over a long period of time. Sabotage understood exactly what they were doing with the messenger, so I could not wait to see how they'd handle the large-scale project. In this case, a turn-based RPG. Outside of Sabotage's playtesters and team members, I think I might be actually the person who has put the most time into this game behind closed doors. I've seen stuff that has since been left on the cutting room floor and have experienced custom content that doesn't exist anywhere else. And all of that served to hype me up even further for the final release. Again, it warms my heart in an unspeakable way to see how excited everyone is for this title. I feel like I have a stake in the game's success. In all sincerity, Sea of Stars has become one of the most important games I've completed in my career in terms of personal friendships and genuine excitement. And this should come as no surprise. Sabotage nailed it. Utterly, completely aced the assignment. From the combat, to the art direction, to the music, to the story, to the road to completion, Sea of Stars is a masterpiece of an RPG. So I completed this game on Steam, but it's available on pretty much everything. It's day one on Xbox Game Pass and PlayStation Plus, a first for any game out there right now. There is a robust completion process in this game, but none of it ever feels overwhelming. There are 42 achievements, all half of which you earn just by completing the story. The hidden achievements may give the average player trouble, but if you like RPGs, I guarantee you will feel compelled to explore every inch of C of stars on your own and you'll end up completing most of it without breaking a sweat aside from one achievement you cannot miss anything in that first playthrough and that one achievement is specifically designed for new game plus finding collectibles and finishing side quests to unlock their associated achievements feels as natural as using sun magic on a zombie there are also plenty of accessibility options in the form of relics that can be turned on or off at any given moment so if you want to cruise through the story you totally can but if you are going Going full completionist, there's plenty to keep in mind. There is a lot of stuff to find in the form of rainbow conches, recipes, quiz packs, music sheets, and building a village from the ground up. Most of these are contained within the 187 chests you'll find scattered throughout the world, though some are rewards for completing quest lines, talking to NPCs, or finishing mini games. And of course, there are RPG staples like a game within a game, secret boss battles, ultimate weapons, and alternate endings, or in this case, a true ending. I'm trying to keep things relatively spoiler light, and that even includes what you get for completing the game. But know that the story of Sea of Stars kind of blows my mind, and I do want to talk about it in depth at some point in the future. Maybe I'll do my first ever follow-up video to discuss spoiler and in-depth points of view, like a post book club review. Let me know if that's something that you're into because I would love to do more stuff like that. Sabotage envisioned Sea of Stars as the game they would eventually create if they had the time, resources, and cultural clout. With the success of The Messenger, that dream became a reality. You can feel the love and care that have been poured into every aspect of design. And in completing it, I saw some of my own dreams come true too. From the
the moment I saw the concept art, I knew that Sea of Stars was going to look spectacular. Sabotage proved with the messenger that they knew how to pay homage to pixel art styles from the past. And Sea of Stars is where the artists, animators, and programmers stunted on everyone. Sea of Stars more than just looks pretty. Its entire presentation, especially the music and sound design, is a magnificent expectation shattering throwback. It starts with a lengthy introduction where players meet the mysterious archivist, a fourth wall breaking narrator who sets our stage. And soon enough, we meet our protagonists, Zale and Valer, solstice warriors who wield the power of the sun and moon respectively. Valer and Zale have just finished their years long training and are finally setting out into the world to take on the creations of the Fleshmancer, a powerful evil sorcerer. The intro establishes the high fantasy stakes the solstice warriors must deal with, but also keeps things grounded with a third party member, their childhood friend, warrior cook Garl, a fantastic cook and the good natured heart of the group. This is not hyperbole, you will see this. Garl is the best goddamn character in the game. You will fall in love with this boy early on, and he will carry you throughout. While the story seems basic at first, it is very far from that. Sea of Stars will make you laugh, it'll make you cry, you're gonna experience all kinds of highs and lows, twists and turns, and there's even a few that will flat out shock you, especially because you end up developing relationships with so many of these characters through and through. This is a Chrono Trigger ass story with Chrono Trigger ass vibes and it'll fill your heart with love and compassion and then tear it down to nothing and then do it again and again over and over. The sign of a great roller coaster of a story. But I do want to bring up a feeling that I felt about halfway through the game and it's a baby spoiler, but not really if you've been paying attention to where the roots of Sea of Stars begins. How do I put it? Sea of Stars takes place eons and eons before the game The Messenger. So if you've completed The Messenger, this game is one gigantic payoff. There are so many moments in Sea of Stars that if you really pay attention, the building blocks and the foundations of The Messenger are here front and center. And the best part, if you've never played The Messenger, it's not going to make you feel left out by any means. I guess this example right here is the best way that I can describe it. Wow, what a lovely, peaceful area. It's so pretty, look at that. Uh, the leaves aren't usually that color. Oh my god, it's Autumn Hills! It's Autumn Hills, the first stage from the messenger! Oh, that music! It's sending me! It's sending me! It's so good! It's so good! Oh wow, a sleeping dragon. Look, he, he looks so cool and like comfy and... Damn, I wish I was there. Yo, that's my boy Wentworth. Wentworth is back and he's sleeping all comfy in a mountain. What up, Wentworth? Oh, dude. Dude, it's Wentworth, I know him. He's a friend from work. Oh, wow, look, an enemy with a DJ table. That's fascinating. And he's in the mountains and that's not where, that's not where they belong. They, they're indoors. Yo, Boulder Douche is back, DJ Boulder Douche. Yes. Oh, look at him, he's spinning. He's spinning it. He's, I just want to, I just want to spin with him. I just want to spin with him. Spin it! I have to hand it to Terry and his team. It felt as if they reached a hand in the depths of my most cherished memories and remixed them to make an entirely new thing. And I know I won't be the only one here who feels that way. The whole aesthetic and story and presentation will resonate with an entire generation of RPG lovers today. Sea of Stars feels indulgent, in the best way possible. The entire thing is a throwback to the Super NES era, and this informs the way everything was developed. Take the introduction of Teeks the Traveling Historian. Sabotage proves throughout this entire game that they can animate their sprites beautifully. Every weapon flourish and enemy detail is packed to the brim with expression. But then Teeks shows up and loses her shit at the presence of the Solstice Warriors and she teleports all around our main characters in a barely animated sequence that had me laughing out loud. They knew the effect this choice would have on anyone who's an RPG fan, and it totally works. Square Enix and their HD 2D approach is a beautiful presentation method, but I came away from Sea of Stars amazed at how much personality was imbued into everything. Rather than a fully top-down perspective, most of Sea of Stars takes place from an isometric view, meaning that depth, shadows, and lighting are critically important. And that lighting, whew, sublime. 
the team developed a dynamic lighting system that is stunning to behold. Day and night are reoccurring motifs, what with Valer and Zale having the powers of the sun and the moon. And seeing shadows stretch across a grassy plain made me feel like I was a kid running through a field during a golden sunset. And because their Kickstarter did so well, Sabotage was able to budget out for some animated cutscenes at certain story beats. And these beats go super hard. They almost feel like special rewards, like how cutscenes felt back in the day. Every biome feels distinct and memorable, from cave diving into the mole mines to windswept deserts slittered with massive skulls. There's a real sense of authorship to every location. This game is a a wonder to behold, especially in action. The way the characters run, jump, climb, and grapple all look super smooth. I can't say enough about how wonderful the art direction is, but I gotta cut myself off here because I'm gonna spend the next three to four hours discussing the score. Holy shit, folks, the music. I thought the soundtrack for The Messenger was incredible. Eric Brown, AKA Rainbow Dragon Eyes, and my friend now, composed some of my favorite video game music of all time with that score in The Messenger. But with Sea of Stars, my man has outdone himself somehow. Every theme, every track, every hook is expressive and emotional. In RPGs, music is an integral piece of that puzzle. Today, full orchestration and even touring concerts of video game music is the norm. Back in the day, if you wanted memorable soundtracks with lots of variety, you would turn to RPGs. The lush soundtracks of RPGs from the Super Nintendo era were the result of improved technology and the exploding popularity of video games. Developers and composers suddenly had incredible creative of freedom with the Super NES sound chip, and they pushed the system as hard as they could with amazing results. You all know I love Chrono Trigger and Final Fantasy VI, and their soundtracks are a big reason for that. All that to say, Sea of Stars' soundtrack finds its place among the greats. Following Eric's journey as a musician, it is clear to me that he put just as much passion into the soundtrack as the artists did with the lighting and the animation. Sea of Stars picked a daunting mountain to climb. The game invokes direct comparisons to some of my favorite all-time soundtracks, but it meets that challenge head on. It also doesn't hurt that the composer for Chrono Trigger, Yasunori Mitsuda, composed 10 whole tracks for the project. The team wanted to evoke Chrono Trigger vibes, so why not reach out to the man himself? Turn Turns out, Masuda was a huge fan of what Eric had done with the messenger and was eager to lend his expertise to Sea of Stars. This is a match made in heaven, as Masuda's tracks are gorgeous and fit right in with the groundwork that Eric has laid. In a Game Informer featurette, Eric says that Sabotage wanted to replicate the sounds of the past, even though Sea of Stars could never have existed on a Super NES. The team deliberately placed limitations on themselves to capture that lightning in a bottle vibe that made old school RPG so magical, and that includes the soundtrack. There's even hit stop during battle, a callback to when sound effects would interrupt music tracks during a fight. I felt the thought and the effort put into that soundtrack, and even the sound effects. You spend a lot of time in menus in RPGs, and even the blips and bloops of selection can add to the overall experience of completing the game. I'm happy to say that even the tiniest menu selection sound is very pleasing. Maybe not as instantly iconic as Final Fantasies, but still really great. Some of my favorite tracks are the battle music, the level up music, and even the overworld theme. But I especially want to call out the music during the Stormcaller boss battle. Your party faces a vengeful ghost pirate captain and his sea monster sidekick. And the track that plays during the battle is the epic ska underscoring that I've always wanted and needed. It's such a jam and I'm amazed that it's here. The soundtrack also benefits from Eric's metalhead background, with some bosses having speed metal thrasher tracks wailing along in the background. Now this might not scream RPG to you, but I think the score perfectly lines up with Sabotage's goals and sensibilities. There are plenty of sweeping orchestral themes and beautiful overworld music. Why not let the talented Rainbow Dragon Eyes absolutely melt your mind with some total bangers that wouldn't be out of place blasting over a mosh pit? Throw the horns out, baby! What's even crazier is that there's a third composer slash arranger, Reese Miller, who arranged pirate-esque versions of a lot of the tracks that Eric and Mitsuda played. To me, I think of this soundtrack as the sequel soundtrack 
to The Messenger. Yes, Sea of Stars is a prequel story-wise, but I think both scores are complementary. For some reason, I was reminded of the System of a Down double album release of Hypnotize and Mesmerize. Similar, yet different. And each album helps you understand the other one. A continued tone tied between two separate albums. All this to say, the soundtrack adds so much to the experience and that's reflected in the completion criteria. As you explore the world, you'll come across several music sheets that you can then hand off to NPCs. And from then on, every time you visit an inn or a bar, you'll have more and more pirating music to choose from that your traveling pirate friends will happily play. I always love a music player as a completion bonus, and the way that Superstars presents theirs is wonderful. Sea of Stars draws you in with its looks and sounds. It makes a strong first impression, but all that appealing pixel art and gorgeous music would be meaningless without a foundation of solid gameplay. Unfortunately, we've got some of the strongest ever. Sea of Stars takes inspiration seriously, but emerges with a gameplay system all its own. It feels familiar and satisfying, refreshing and modern all at once. It also pushes players towards completion without them even realizing it half the time. Pretty much everything you could ever want from a modern slash old school RPG is here. Turn-based combat that feels exciting and snappy, side quests that add depth to characters, collectibles that actually feel good to come across, puzzles that are rewarding and challenging, knockdown drag out boss fights with tremendous music, and best of all for people like me, a strong feeling of satisfaction that comes from doing everything. I want to reiterate something. Completing this game is so good that for the first time ever, I can't really share with you what you get for completing the game because of how truly rewarding it is to complete it. I can show you the achievement scores and numbers for things earned and whatnot, but showing you what you get is a very difficult thing without ruining the experience. For developers who want to pay their respects to the games of their childhood, striking a balance between the sometimes archaic systems of the past and modern design conventions can be difficult. Sabotage pulled off a combat system that feels engaging and balanced, but still could be feasible on an older console. They've been completely transparent about their inspirations, and I think that makes the game stronger. The timed hits and bonus stat boosts when you level up? Straight out of Mario RPG. The combo attacks? That's Chrono Trigger. You can even unleash ultimate attacks that could be compared to Final Fantasy or Golden Sun summons. Now, I grew up on games like this, so I felt as if I could appreciate the references being made, as well as discern the nuances and distinctions. If you're new to RPGs, you'll still find a lot to enjoy here. So you've got three members in your party for majority of the game, but over the course of the whole thing, you'll actually get six playable characters. In battles, you can only have three characters act per round, but you can swap party members freely without taking a turn. Very Final Fantasy X-like. Characters have different attacks and skills to use, and you'll want to be aware of their specialties to break certain locks and totally shut down your enemies. Every enemy from the lowest Golgol to the most powerful secret boss has strong attacks that can be interrupted if you know what you're doing. These strong attacks will be telegraphed by having several locks, basically weak points, appear over the enemy. If you break those locks by attacking with moves that match the symbols, enemies will lose their turn in which they may or may not have been planning a big attack or healing themselves. Certain battles start to feel like puzzles to solve where you must make the choice between defending yourself for a turn or going all out to break locks. And as the game goes on, you integrate a new mechanic where when you hit an enemy, they drop these magical orbs on the floor. You can have up to three of them on the ground. And if you charge up, Every party member that receives that charge gains the element bonus they're from. So maybe Zale wants to do an attack where he has to do a sword and a sun icon, but only has one turn left. He can power up and make his attack passively have sun powers. It evolves more and more as time goes on. The timed hits are a fantastic way to make combat feel engaging and encouraging, and mastering these inputs is essential for the completion process. For most attacks, if you time a button press, you'll deal additional pain. When defending, you can massively mitigate damage received by timing your block to right when the enemy hits you. It feels great to perfectly time blocks and attacks. 
And to me, that went a long way towards making every fight feel fun. And most importantly, every attack is somewhat blockable. The lock system is an awesome twist on elemental weaknesses that forces you to fully engage with all of your skills instead of relying on just the ye old faithful. Party member management is very streamlined. You don't have to worry about your character customization too much. You'll find new weapons and armor as you explore dungeons, but you won't have to stress out about fiddling with your party or wondering whether or not you're fully optimized. Late game, you'll definitely want to tinker with the rings and other specialty pieces you encounter, but for the base game, the difficulty is perfectly tuned to get you through the main quest. As a reminder, I am obviously very biased about this game, but something I saw a lot of while reading reviews and impressions about Sea of Stars was that a lot of folks had the complaint that they didn't quite think the game got more and more in depth with regards to battling. But to me, that's a big red flag for a few reasons. The biggest one being, by the time you get to the end of the game and you're fighting all these big secret bosses, the amount of locks that appear on screen, the mechanics of the certain moves, and the overall presentation and spectacle of the fights definitely indicate that you need to know everything that's going on in the game to complete those fights. Essentially, if you didn't learn the essentials from the beginning of the game and you rested on your laurels the entire time, there is no way you could have beaten the game. The combat is so based in the depth and development of what it's like to get good at combat that it kind of tells me there's one big red flag here. That one, this game was too easy for some of these folks and they could have said that in their little reviews. Or two, they didn't get far enough into the game to realize how intricate the combat gets. Every single boss fight in this game is a puzzle. Sabotage wanted combat to be manageable yet active, and they succeeded. You can mash through most normal enemies with just basic attacks, but combat encourages you to use everything at your disposal. Basic attacks restore a little bit of MP and also cause enemies to drop living mana, which characters can then absorb to up to three times for a huge boost on their next move. At its best, combat finds you planning out a couple of moves ahead, swapping party members as needed to dish out maximum damage as you also think about what defense and any potential combo moves you can fire off next. But if you really want to enjoy the story and not stress out about the battles, Sea of Stars has some great accessibility options. The relic system lets you flip modifiers on and off as you see fit. You can reduce the damage you take during battle, increase the experience points you earn, or even gain full heal and double your HP after every battle. There are a couple of relics that make the game more challenging, but only one of them is tied to an achievement, which I wouldn't even have to deal with until New Game Plus. So I indulged in my fair share of the relics as I saw fit. Since timed hits are crucial to combat, players will love the Sequent Flare Relic, which gives you feedback on how well you're nailing the timing of timed hits. Once you learn the subtleties of timed hits, you can then turn that relic off. The game never punishes you or comments on whether or not you can use the relics. And if I'm being honest, I'm an old school kind of guy here. I only used the relics that I thought would give me a classic gameplay feel or teach me mechanics I was struggling with in the beginning. There was one relic that is in fact essential for completion that honestly, I wish that every game had. You can get a bird that squawks at your world map and tells you if you've collected every item, chest, and done everything in that part of that map. It's very helpful for completionists. And there's no shame in using any relics, especially all the ones that make fishing easier, because there is a lot of fishing. In fact, there's a lot to do straight out of combat in general. I do want to call out one of the cooler mini games in the game called Wheels. It's a tabletop game that's super easy and fun to play. And you must defeat all six champions and battle the final master in order to earn special items, not only attached to achievements, but for that final completion as well. In Wheels, you pick two figurines based off of a class of character, knight, mage, etc. And you and your opponent both have 10 hit points each. You then roll this wheel up to three times that will give you six panels of either a hammer, an orange square, or a teal diamond. You can then lock in those choices so that when you spin the wheel again for time two or time three, that you keep the ones you want. Every time you earn a certain amount of squares or diamonds, it makes one of your figurines attack the enemy base. The hammer icons help build up walls to protect you. And if any of the icons have a starry background, it means your figurine can go up one point in terms of leveling experience. And then you can upgrade your figurine from bronze to gold, making it more powerful. First to nail 10 points of damage wins. 
This game at first seemed very daunting, but I very quickly learned how to play the game and became an expert almost immediately. Exploration plays a surprisingly large role. Every environment has unique puzzles to solve and the rewards are almost always worth it. Dungeons have hidden chests or puzzles that you can't solve until you come back later on with extra skills. I love when an RPG lets you interact with the world in different ways and Sea of Stars feels particularly alive in that sense. I mentioned that seamlessness was a major focus of the team during development, and it was on my mind as I completed everything. Every new mechanic ties back to completion in some way. Early on, you meet Teeks, a traveling historian who acts basically as a lore master. You can find items that Teeks can analyze, and then she'll tell you a story about that artifact. Stories serve to not only flesh out the world, a few of them even give hints about riddles and side quests to complete. So not only will you grow more and more invested in the world as a result of listening to Teeks, you'll want to go out and explore even more as you parse out riddles. Resting also lets you cook meals, another important mechanic. Garl, the warrior cook and the most lovable party member by a mile, teaches Zale and Valer how to cook at the beginning of the adventure. From there, you find recipes and make meals at campfires using ingredients you found or bought out in the world. The thing is, you can only carry 10 meals at a time, but it's a snap to take a minute to see what you can make. It always brought a smile to my face to see that art pop up as you cook. There are no extra items to manage during a fight, just your own skills and your meals. The only things I think are missing from the battle menu, really overall, is a dedicated defend option and maybe a runaway button. Using your wits and skills to fully explore dungeons to find new combo moves and then turning around to use those new abilities in battle always feels great. You will want to go out of your way to open up every chest as even the smallest collectible feels very necessary. Now, the amazing rainbow conches won't seem useful until several hours in. But once you meet the right person to give them to, there's a whole menu of rewards and completion to uncover. Exploration feels great on its own, and I found myself eager to crack Sea of Stars wide open, because the world that Sabotage has built is beautiful and inviting. They have built a universe that is incredibly cohesive and emotionally grounded, and the story that Sea of Stars tells only becomes stronger the more you invest in that completion experience. Now you've all heard me beat this drum before if you've watched my stuff. I love the unique ways that games can tell stories. Some of my favorite stories ever are told from RPGs. Sea of Stars, in my mind, tells a brilliant tale. Its depth only grows the more effort you make to complete everything in it. Sea of Stars remixes the fantasy tropes and adds its own brand of wonderful originality that makes it a joy to complete. I think it's the sincerity that makes Sea of Stars so impactful. I really love the writing in The Messenger, but I can also see how its meta approach might be off-putting to some. Sea of Stars has some moments where characters break the fourth wall completely, but it never feels too snarky for its own good or like it's trying to be overly clever. Instead, you're invited along to laugh and enjoy the ride. Let's take Captain Cliche, for example. This pirate captain who's in charge of the crew you help early on in your adventure for what is basically the first or second dungeon is a strong, mysterious leader who commands the respect of her comrades. She's got a hook for a hand and a fierce demeanor, but don't be fooled, twist. She's actually a mysterious assassin who helps Valer, Zale, and Garl with some solstice warrior business. But Terry is fully aware that players will probably have figured that out. Instead of it being played for the drama, Captain Cliche's big reveal is played for comedy, and it works. But there are many twists that are actual twists, and these are played straightforward very effectively. You can get through the story in about 30 hours if you skip most of the side content, probably sooner to be honest, and it's a thrill ride the entire time. I personally recommend recommend taking the time to veer off the main path and do side quests because they are always rewarding from an item and collectible standpoint and also serve to deepen the main cast. Every party member and important NPC has an intriguing fleshed out backstory that made me very invested in this world. As stated previously, Sea of Stars and the Messenger take place in the same universe. I expected some crossover, but the way the characters, events, and themes weave together is stunning. I thought there would be a handful of reoccurring enemies, and there are the teleporting wizards, the leaves and twigs mini boss, and of course, the one and only 
DJ Douche. But I did not expect there to be full on character arcs that are set up in Sea of Stars and then paid off in The Messenger. Even the overworld map itself is packed full of references to the future alluded to in The Messenger. Now, if you played The Messenger, you would know that a massive flood will eventually overtake the land. But in Sea of Stars, things are just getting started. I love that a lot of the areas that are from The Messenger are just as important as they are in Sea of Stars. And I have no doubt that if Sabotage continues to build out this world, then we'll continue to see even more references and lore. I can't wait to see what they come up with next, and who knows if there'll even be DLC. The possibilities are endless with Sea of Stars. Given my personal history of forgetting to fill out backer rewards for a lot of the games I support, sorry indie devs, when I came across the crypt in Sea of Stars, I was immediately overwhelmed with emotion. This crypt is a tribute to the backers of a certain tier, where they could memorialize a loved one by designing an epitaph, tombstone, or statue. They could memorialize themselves, friends, family, whatever. It's a beautiful space, and upon entering it, I instantly felt crushing disappointment as I realized that once again, I had forgotten to fill out this particular backer reward. But upon seeing everyone's contributions, I legitimately teared up. So many folks donated their Kickstarter rewards to memorialize loved ones from animals to the ones that are no longer with us. There was something so special and unifying about seeing all these amazing tributes by what I would say are people who are total strangers. And yet we all felt united as one. Although I felt very sad discovering the crypt, I felt even more sad that I was not able to do a proper tribute to anyone or a thing. But soon after the crypt, there I was, sitting there, introduced for the player to see, Gerard the Constructionist. And he's here to help you build up the town of Mirth and more importantly, he's a part of your completion journey. Constructing every building on the island of Mirth nets you one achievement, but that's because it's tied to adding facilities to the city. There's a shop, an inn, a spa, and a fishing facility. All of these facilities offer something special that go towards completion and are absolutely required if you're going to get all of the rainbow conches. I was humbled to see my character portrait and completely floored when I realized that completing my quest line is actually important to the entire journey of completing the game. So Terry and I have pretty different opinions about trophies and achievements. As a designer, they aren't something that he often feels compelled to chase just because they're there. But we do agree that trophies should feel important. Some of the best parts of Sea of Stars were when I overcame a difficult battle or got to the end of a hidden quest line and saw that achievement pop up, memorializing that moment forever. Terry and Sabotage use an in-game achievement system to guide players to specific things. You're welcome, Switch users. And it's incredibly effective. After blasting countless enemies with a reflective Moonerang skill, I noticed that there was an achievement associated with reflecting the attack 25 times. It was very satisfying to master that attack and earn that achievement. The beautiful thing about these achievements in the game is that they are all obtainable at any given time in your journey, provided you didn't start New Game Plus prematurely once you beat the game. There is, however, one achievement that stands out as one of the hardest in the game. But when you break down how to get it, it's not that bad. There's an achievement for using a particular relic that subtracts 95% of your max health. In doing so, if you missed a timed hit to defend yourself, you take big damage. However, if you protect yourself via the timed hits, your damage will be severely reduced should you time it properly. And if you execute timed hits correctly to the enemy, you do double damage. It's very much the glass cannon relic, as the achievement requires you to beat 10 bosses with that relic on. There's a few caveats to that relic. You can only get that relic towards the very end of the game before one of the many secret boss fights. And at that point, there are not that many bosses left to really fight in the end. So the best plan of action to get this achievement is by starting New Game Plus and defeating all the bosses with this relic on. This achievement will be earned about halfway through the game. So it'll take you anywhere from 8 to 15 hours to get this achievement considering your skill. I did confirm with Terry and the team that once you get that achievement and you've done everything else, Else, there is no point to complete the game again a second time. So my recommendation, complete everything you can in that first playthrough. Make this your end victory lap so you can enjoy the journey a second time. The nice thing about this achievement is that the relic counts only when you fight bosses. So you can take it off before and after each fight. But be forewarned, there are elite bosses that do not count when wearing the relic. The secret here is to pay attention to that boss music. If it's the normal boss music, it probably counts towards the end of your goal. I do want to rewind a little bit as, don't worry, no spoilers. 
Defeating the final boss and finishing the story is just the start of the completion journey. Like any good RPG, this one lets you save right before the final fight, and you can exit the dungeon to clean up any lingering bits of business you were missing. But Sea of Stars also sets up a pretty interesting precedent. You must defeat the final boss and see the ending one time before you can truly complete the game. Now you can do a majority, if not all of the completion side quests and things to do before fighting that final boss. But even if you collect all 60 rainbow conscience, effectively also getting all the chests in the game, the completion process cannot continue until you've at least cleared the game one time. I'm not going into the ending because it's very special, trust me. Beating the game gives you a silver star on your profile and lets you start a new file on New Game Plus if you'd like. Or you can pick off where you left off in your original file. But like I said, in this case, you're gonna wanna pick that back up. There's a lot of side islands and dungeons to explore. Resolving these quests leads to the most powerful gear for each party member. So make it a priority to visit all the remaining Solstice Shrines, tackle the arena in Port Brisk, explore the desert with Sarai to battle a giant robot gun goddess, and journey to the depths of the ocean to fight a slug. All of these quests feel satisfying to complete and help get you gear that you'll need for that final, final confrontation. Because of course the first battle against the ultimate evil isn't actually the last one. If you find all 60 rainbow conches and turn them in, you'll be given the rainbow star which uncovers a mystery of the Ring of Stones in the Moorlands, an area you discover very early on in the game. A lot of you folks playing this game are gonna see that and go, what's that for? That's what it's for. This post-game twist completely changes everything and unlocks even more stuff to do. Fully completing Sea of Stars is, in my opinion, the only way to really play this game. Seeing the true ending is a magical full circle experience that takes everything and makes it that much more fulfilling. It also is the only way to unlock a few more hidden achievements that require you to have your full party, which brings me back to what I talked about into my intro, me being in the game, which let me tell you, once again, is extremely humbling. Once you've done all the final quest lines for every party member, it's time to go back to the final boss and challenge them again. Except here's the thing. It's a whole different battle because of what you've changed by getting every item. The true final battle has a few twists, but if you've got all the end game equipment and have mastered breaking locks and timed hits, you'll be just fine, I promise. Finishing this fight rolls through the credits again and puts a gold star on your profile indicating that you've done it all. Except here's the thing, you haven't done it all because Sea of Stars just keeps on giving. There is one final bonus for the most dedicated of players that I've actually been asked to not spoil, to not tell you at all what it is. I've done it, I know where it is, but I'm honoring the dev's wishes and I'm not gonna show it to you because I know it's worth it. If you have fully completed the game, including the true ending, you should have four mysterious items in your inventory called flimsy hammers. So what are these hammers for, you might ask? I'm not gonna tell you. I know what they're for. I've seen it. I know what it does. But I'm not gonna tell you. Sometimes, the mystery of completing something has to be left for people to find. When you finally get all the feats in the game, check your book inside of the pirate ship. When doing so, you'll notice that not only do you have every single feat, but now it's all gold. And in this case, that means you also have all the achievements for your platform. So in my case, Steam. As far as I know, nothing else is affected by this, but it is pretty cool. I will share the elements of how to get these four hammers, however. You collect four hammers by doing the following. The first one, catching one kind of every fish in the game and speaking to the fisherman in the hut that Gerard the Constructionist has built for you. Two, beating all the champions in the game of Wheel, including the final champion hidden in the clock tower. Three, trivia. There are trivia question packs that you find, and if you collect all 11 packs, beat both modes of casual and expert, your final prize will be a flimsy hammer. And finally, beating the game with the final true ending earns you a flimsy hammer. I know it seems so sh** of me to not tell you, the viewer at home, why you should complete this game on both of these fronts. 
one for the 16 rainbow conches, and two for the four flimsy hammers. But trust me when I say, some mysteries are left for you to solve on your own for your own completionist's journey. And I'm sure at some point or another, someone on YouTube will ruin it before I do. That's the whole point of this video. I usually spoil everything when it comes to completion, but I will not spoil it for you because if you've loved playing this game, then I would be spoiling the heart and soul of what you love, let alone what the devs love about their own game. What I will leave you with is this. Sea of Stars will leave a lasting impact on all of your lives. And I hope that someday that I'm able to do something that will leave the same impact and legacy of my friends, family, and supporters in that same way. It has always been my goal as the completionist to make a difference no matter how small. I feel as though that I have helped achieve that goal when my passion for the messenger kind of helped, I guess. I just want to see developers cooking and watching Terry and his team work and grow over the years has been a tremendous highlight of my life. I love being able to see people and help push themselves to do their best. And that's what's fully on display here. A team of sincere and earnest developers who have poured hours into their hearts and souls with these beautiful pixels. Completing this game today made my heart feel so full. If I weren't in this game, I would still give Sea of Stars my completionist rating of completed because Sabotage has created a modern classic born out of passion and excitement. It clearly shows and further proves that you can make a throwback game that still feels modern, exciting, and fun. I wanna see more titles like this, and I hope that you enjoy this episode as much as I've enjoyed completing Sea of Stars. Thank you so much for watching. Please complete this game, and I'll see you all soon. Good night.